you may think that a strange reading for Good Friday. But here we see with disturbing insight how Jesus himself understood his impending doom. The tension between the Pharisees and the other religious leaders and Jesus had been building. Jesus saw his mission as to seek and to save the lost. But the Pharisees wanted to keep as far away from the lost, those sinners, those tax collectors, those prostitutes, as possible. But the lost, like the younger son in the parable of the lost sons, were coming to their senses. They were realising that life without God was not all that it was cracked up to be and they were gathering to hear Jesus and hanging on his every word. The religious leaders, grumpy at how all their traditions were being broken and no interest in saving the lost, just stood there, arms folded, indignant at Jesus and the sinners. But this parable, this This parable sheds much light on Jesus' death and where it fits in God's dealing with Israel over time. Running as a beautiful golden thread throughout Scripture is the concept that Israel, as God's chosen nation, special nation, was his vineyard. And from the nation of Israel, as his vineyard, he expected growth, yield, return. And for those who know their Old Testament, um, Jesus' reference, for for those who knew their Old Testament as Jesus told this story, Jesus' reference to the Old Testament would have resonated. Reference to vineyard and tenants and expected fruit. That, That concept would not have been unfamiliar. The man who planted the vineyard is reminiscent of God himself. The tenants are the religious leaders throughout Israel's history. The servants he sends are the prophets who down through time were sent to hold Israel to account. They were often treated shamefully. They were ignored. They were rejected. In Jesus' story, the owner of the vineyard, reminiscent of God, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. My son whom I love. Remember the words at Jesus' baptism? Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus understands and makes clear that he himself is the Son of the owner who the owner sends in the light of the continual rejection of the prophets. But the tenants, the religious leaders of Jesus' time, decide Let's kill him. They had done that since early on in Jesus' ministry, thinking that they will retain the power and assume leadership and ownership. Let's kill him. He's a threat. We don't want him to rule over us. We don't want to surrender to him. We don't need him or love him or respect him or honour him. And the story ends as Jesus announced that the tenants will be outed and the vineyard given to Others, that is, the, tenant, the vineyard will be taken from Israel and given to the Gentiles. Because in a mixing of metaphors, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That is, the very one the religious leaders, the religious leaders rejected, became the one upon whom God's new work of the church was built. And in immediate fulfilment of the very story Jesus told, did they not see the irony, the reality? We read that the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against him. Yes, yes, religious leaders, he had indeed. The reaction to Jesus, still the same today, perhaps even reflected by some watching today. Jesus rejected or Jesus revered? Are you plotting, as it were, to get rid of him, to exclude him from your life? Or have you welcomed him, hanging on every word, and have surrendered to him? Plotting to exclude him will result, as it did for the tenants in Jesus' story, will result in you being excluded. 
but welcoming him and surrendering to him will result in you being welcomed and embraced and forgiven and reconciled. That is why today is Good Friday. His name was Barabbas. He was in prison for rioting and murder, exactly where he should have been. He wasn't the sort of person you'd like your daughters to date. He was against the Romans, he was against the elite of Israel, he was against just about everything. And he loved causing trouble. But the Roman governor had a tradition, it was a kind of a sop to the nation of Israel and their religious traditions. That every year at the Passover, he released a prisoner chosen by the crowd. Not for a moment did Barabbas ever expect that it would be him. He had enemies everywhere. So you can imagine his surprise when they pulled him out of his cell and stood him on the platform right next to Jesus and the crowd was asked, which one? Barabbas had heard about Jesus, no doubt. Uh, Heard that he attracted crowds wherever he went. Heard that he was a popular teacher, people hanging on every word. Heard that he had healed people, even raised some from the dead. But he also knew, I'm guessing, I'm supposing, (laughs) that the religious people didn't like Jesus. He didn't fit their plans. They were jealous of all the attention he was getting. He broke their rules. He got their noses out of joint. He hung round with the likes of Barabbas more than the religious people. And now here was Barabbas and Jesus standing side by side. Jesus, of course, had done nothing wrong. And Governor Pilate knew that too. Then there was that moment when Pilate asked, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to release? Jesus Or Barabbas. And the crowd calls out, Barabbas! Barabbas! Amazing. Then Pilate asked the crowd, Well, what do you want me to do with this Jesus? And they just shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate, Pilate, trying not to do that, Asked why, what crime has he committed? But then they shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. So Barabbas was released there and then. He went free, walked away, as if he'd never done anything wrong. And the innocent one got what was coming to Barabbas. He didn't deserve that. And Barabbas went free. He didn't deserve that. (laughs) Jesus got death. Barabbas got life. Had Barabbas looked up at that hill outside the city that afternoon and saw Jesus hanging there, he might well have said to himself, "That, that should have been me. That should have been me. But Barabbas' story is your story if you trust Jesus. You've been set free. You have been released. God treating you as if you'd never done anything wrong. The price has been paid by Jesus. And you walk away. He got death. And if you're one who trusts Jesus, you get life. You too can say, that that should have been me. And that is why today is Good Friday.
Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What did Jesus mean? It's been a tough few days, a tortuous few hours. I'm glad it's over. I don't think so. Uh, Was it a grim resignation to the fact that his death was imminent? Was he giving up? I've, I've had enough. It's all too much. I'm done. Was it a cry of defeat? They have won. It's finished. They got me. No, 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 and no. It it was none of those. This wasn't Jesus resigning to an inevitable end, nor was it a cry of defeat. It's actually more like a victory cry. It was a cry of mission accomplished. What his father had sent him to do, he had done. What was that? Can I just remind you from the Bible what Jesus had come to do that had now been done? He came into this world to bring light to its darkness. He took on human flesh and made his dwelling among us. He came with grace and truth to make the Father known. He became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He came to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, to take the punishment that brought us peace. He came into the world to save sinners. He came to be our advocate before the Father. He came to become sin for us so that we might become right with God. He came to die for us while we were still sinners. He came came to redeem us by his blood, which means the forgiveness of sins. He came to be the means by which we are justified through faith and therefore have peace with God. He came to make us alive with him even when we were dead in our transgressions. He came to forgive us all our sins, cancelling the written code that stood against us. He came to reconcile all things to himself by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. He came to bear our sin in his body on the tree. He came to save us by his sheer mercy and not by anything we had done. He came to be a sacrifice for us, to take away the sins of many. He came to open a new way into the holy presence of God through the curtain that we might approach God with confidence. He came to make it possible for us to become new creation. He came to be the means by which God reconciles us to himself. All that he finished. He finished the work of your salvation. If you have repented and believed, put your trust in him. He came came to finish the work of of cancelling your sin. He finished the work of reconciling you to his Father. He came to finish opening access to the presence of the Father. All this was being finished as Jesus breathed his last. It is finished, Jesus said. And with that, he bowed his head 
and gave up his spirit. And that is why today is Good Friday.